Hello. I'd like to start by thanking Chawton House for the invitation to speak at this fantastic online literary festival. It's a great initiative. My name is Caroline Jane Knight. I'm the fourth great granddaughter of Edward Austin Knight and the fifth great niece of Jane Austen. And people actually often ask me, or, or it's not unusual for me to be asked, when did I first find out I was related to Jane? Or what, you know, how did it feel to find out that I was related to Jane Austen? But, um, but I didn't have a first day. Um, I had the absolute privilege of growing up at Chawton House um, and I lived there until I was 18. So um, Jane Austen is somebody who I have known about since the day I was born. Um, I've always known, obviously, about Jane and her fantastic um, legacy and achievements and what an incredible woman she was. Um, and of course, I've always also known about the Knight family in Chawton House um, because that's what I grew up in. I was born on uh, 28th of August 1970. Um, and by this point, my family had been um, at Chawton House had been standing for nearly 400 years. It was built by John Knight around 1585. It obviously would have taken some time um, and has been passed down through generation to generation all the way to Richard Knight, my uncle, who's now the owner. Um, I'm not going to go into the history because I'm sure you all know that very, very well. And it's obviously well documented. Um, Life for us, by the time I was born, my parents and my brother, Paul Edward Knight, who's five years older than me, were already living at Chawton House. Dad had obviously grown up there and then gone back there um, when, when him and mum had, had Paul. Um, and they were living in the basement quarters. And the basement had originally been storerooms for the house, a knife store, a linen store, those sorts of things. But in the 1950s had actually been converted into a sort of small living, you know, a small apartment um, for... Um, I think the housekeeper at the time, um, it had been converted for, for her and her husband to live in. But my father actually made it bigger and knocked through some really thick walls um, through to a gun room and made uh, another bedroom there and then through to um, a boiler room. I think it was actually the other way around. Boiler room first, then gun room um, and actually made it into a three bedroom um, place. And that's where we lived to begin with. It's sort of half underground. It's quite strange. The windows are quite high in the room um, and that's actually ground level outside. But when I was a kid, I loved that. I just loved that sort of feeling. Of course, I mean, it was all very well lit. I'm not saying it was, you know, it wasn't dark and dingy, but uh, I did like that sort of being half underground, um, half underground thing. Everyday life for us was a mixture of complete normality um, and obviously what everyone else was doing and things that weren't necessarily uh, the same as everyone else was doing. Um, I went to the local village school, so I went to Chawton School and then I went to the convent in Alton. My mum and dad lived in Alton um, and we did pretty regular things. And I, uh, you know, we made sandwiches in the morning for lunch and we sat around as a family in the evening um, and had our dinner. Um, and we went on camping holidays to Cornwall and things like that in the, in the summer. But of course, we had a very, um, you know, things that were very different in that our home was Chawton House. Um, and that was completely different from anyone else I knew at the time. Whilst we had obviously this phenomenal property and heritage and 400 years of our history behind, there and ancestors and heritage and all those sorts of things. Um, the money, the fortune, um, the riches, if you like, um, had run out decades, decades and decades and decades before I was born. Um, so as I said, we were in this wonderful surrounding, but certainly um, any, any, any riches and high life was long, long gone by the time I was born. So when I was a child, the main part of the house which um, would include the Great Hall, would include what you would now know as the lower reading room um, and the exhibition rooms upstairs and the upper reading room and all that sort of area of the house was lived in by my grandparents. So that's Elizabeth Knight, um, my grandfather, Edward Knight III, who we know as Bapops. I know as Bapops, that's what we used to call him in the house. Um, and my grandmother was a very formidable very capable very sort of confident woman um and you know even even the boldest people would think twice before crossing granny i, I can tell you um and she very much was sort of front and center and and and, and from my perspective ran the house that, that's you know what i could see granny was running the house um my grandfather bapops um on the other hand was very very quiet um he would have been i think 60 when i was born um, and by this time he led a very quiet life and he spent most of his time um, actually sitting in the library, which was the room that my grandparents used as the sitting room. Um, and the library is now the lower reading room at Chawton House. And in the library, that's where the Knight family collection um, was kept when I was a child. And because Bapops was in there and he was he was 
I mean, obviously he was he was the head of the household. I mean, he owned everything. He was the squire. He was the, um, you know, I had the most enormous amount of respect for him and for sort of who he was in that in in that way. But we had absolutely no relationship at all. Um, I mean, in the seventeen years that we lived in that house, I have no memory of ever. Um, right up until his last days of, of ever having a conversation with him as I said he was he was quite a quiet um, and I suppose largely withdrawn um, man. Um, Granny and Bapots lived with Robert who uh, is my uncle who was who, who's lovely who now lives in Alton. Um, myself and my family lived in the north wing um, so in the basement quarters to begin with um, but then when I was about 12 we moved upstairs still in the north wing to the quarters that included what you all now know as the dining room of Chawton House and that was our sitting room and what a fabulous room that is oak panelled with a fantastic carving above the fireplace and uh, a huge window seat with just the best views across across the driveway actually so you could see who was coming and going and sort of a, a, across the parklands to the church Right on the top floor, we had another aunt and uncle. So my dad's uh, sister and her husband and their three children. So myself and my brother had uh, had company um, of similar ages to us, which, which was lovely. Um, we also had lots of other uh, family. I mean, we're from a you know bigger family. My, my father's got more siblings than that. Um, and so other aunts and uncles and cousins would be frequent visitors, um, including Richard Knight, who obviously uh, is now the owner, um, and his children. And it was always, always lovely to see them. There were also parts of the house then that were actually rented out to tenants, um, sort of, sort of the, you know, far wings of the house that just weren't used by the family anymore. And due to uh, the financial uh, requirement to obviously pay the bills, um, I think that, you know, as I said, a few different parts of the house were sort of converted into little self-contained places. Um, some of the tenants um, I was I was really friendly with actually and used to visit vi visit quite a lot. So other than the actual private quarters that people lived in and that were clearly obviously private quarters, I absolutely moved around the house as if it, you know, as if the whole house was my own. Uh, my court, you know, my family's quarters, my grandparents' quarters and all of the sort of other bit, you know, communal bits of the house, the attics, the, 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 the um, um, you know, the corridors, the tapestry gallery, the, you know, all of the places that, um, that, that, as I said, we could play in as children. It was fantastic. And me and cousin Fiona, who was closest in age to me, who lived on the top floor, we would uh, yeah, just spend hours um, playing in the old kitchen, um, which is now the Chawton House tea room. Um, um, as I said, in the attics, the cellars, in the grounds, we play in the church, in the churchyard and the stables, which is opposite the church. Whilst that is now um, obviously converted into a beautiful property, that was actually still a, still stables um, when I was young. No horses, um, but we'd have great fun, just great fun playing in, in, in you know, 20 acres, really, um, of, 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 of land. And we were I mean, that's where we were just extraordinarily lucky extraordinarily lucky and privileged to have been brought up with just such fantastic adventures every day to be had um and in the sort of safety i suppose and what felt like the real cocoon of 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 chawton house um you know where 400 years of my of my ancestors had been and that's a that's a, that's a really nice uh, safe place to be the walled garden right up at the top of the um, up at the back of the gardens um, that um, has been, you know, it's absolutely beautiful. It's open now. When I lived there, my parents actually used that as a vegetable uh, plot um, and to grow, you know, produce to, to obviously keep us all going. So they could often be found up there at the weekends and I'd go and I'll help for a bit. I can't I can't really pretend that I spent hours helping dad put in the uh, potatoes, um, but I'd certainly uh, certainly give him a hand every now and then. One of my favourite things to do at Chawton House was was to help Granny, and I spent lots of time with Granny, usually cooking. Um, but we made the cricket teas for the cricket team um, every weekend. From the Great Hall at Chawton House, Granny actually ran a tea room during the summer. So every weekend for the summer, we would be open and I earned my pocket money in there, um, serving teas. We'd start in the morning and I'd help with the baking and we'd be baking scones and cakes and, and everything else and getting the tea room set up um, for the day. And then I'd uh, serve the customers for the, for the afternoon. And, uh, and I used to really enjoy that um, as well as obviously enjoy the pocket money that came with it. 
Um, but we were always cooking or baking for something and often it was family lunches um, and and birthdays and, and that sort of thing. And the Great Hall was a, a room that was used for so many things. Um, I mean, as well as, you know, the tea room um, and other events that would, that would happen. As I said, we'd all congregate as a family. We lived in different parts of the house, but we'd all congregate as a family in the Great Hall um, for specific events. Um, least of not which um, was uh, um, Snapdragon at Christmas Eve, which I will tell you about in a minute. Um, one of the things I absolutely loved, probably some of my fondest memories are actually all the public events that used to happen, that had happened for a very long time. So every year the village fete uh, was on the lawns of the house. The horticultural show um, was in the Great Hall um, and in the dining room. Um, we had the Christmas carol service there every year. And of course, every July um, is the Jane Austen Society of the UK. Their AGM is held on the lawns of Chawton House. And that's been going on a long time, since way before I was born. So every year, this enormous marquee um, would be put up on the lawn, which we just, as children, we loved. I mean, it was a couple of days of standing on the stage and accepting awards and, and running around. And one moment it was a circus big top. And as I said, the next top moment we were at the Oscars accepting awards. We had, we had lots of fun with that it was also uh good because lots and lots about 500 chairs from memory um fold out chairs you know would have to be sort of put out in the in this big marquee um and that was just a good way of earning a couple of pounds worth of pocket money um so i always liked that too um and that was obviously an incredibly a busy event and actually sort of that that, that would have been one of the busiest of the year and then after we'd had you know 500 jane austen um um appreciators shall we say um 500 Jane Austen appreciators uh, with us for the day um because the marquee was there and my mum being really clever thought that's an opportunity and actually started running a ball so for the last few years every year we had a ball in the evening in that same marquee um to raise money for the church which was just a fabulous idea while it was there um so uh, so I used to really enjoy that as well always made our own ball dresses um because we obviously uh, you know the finances just weren't there to go and to go and buy them but uh, but that was you know everyone did that back then didn't they that that, that was fine my absolute favourite, 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 favourite night of the year um, was Christmas Eve. And Christmas Eve was a night of tradition where every single year the whole family would gather in the Great Hall um, in, uh, in the evening. And we'd have mince pies, mulled wine and, and a few nibbles and some nice chats and talk about, obviously, uh, you know, the year and what, what would be coming the next day with Christmas and what we were all going to be doing over the holidays. But Christmas Eve itself, and at the appropriate moment, Granny would uh, sort of g give the nod and, and we'd get ready for Snapdragon. And what Snapdragon is, is it's a, it's, um, a parlour game that actually Jane um, was, you know, we know the family were playing back in 1806, I think. Um, Fanny actually makes a comment about it in her, um, in her diary that they played Snapdragon. And a, a very large pewter charger, big pewter plate, um, would be taken down from above the oak panelling in the hallway at Chawton House. There used to be big pewter chargers up there. And one of them would be taken down and 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 I think it was, you know, warmed by the fire and then put on to a, um, a round table in the middle of the room. And then it would be piled high with um, um, currants or raisins. Um, and then a jug of warm brandy would be poured all over it and it would be lit. And obviously the lights turned off. And for a couple of minutes, it seemed, there was just this amazing sort of roar of blue flame. It was huge. Um, and with the lights off, you know, it would flicker ghoulishly in everyone's faces. Um, and the, what you had to do, the snapdragon was actually putting your hands into the fire really quickly to grab the currants and eating them. And if you do it quick enough, you know, this is alcohol burning. It's not very hot at all. And if you do it quick enough, you can do it without getting burnt at all. It doesn't hurt, but it looks like obviously everybody's eating fire. It's spectacular. And it's one of those things that only lasted a couple of minutes, probably tops. Um, but the adrenaline, it was such an exciting sort of moment that uh, that, that we'd be looking forward to that for weeks. Um, I loved Snapdragon and, and it was also such a, you know, also a, a delight to be doing something that, um, that you know, still playing a game that I know my ancestors enjoyed. Um, that's always very nice. 
as I say, Chawton House to me, I just absolutely loved it. Loved, loved, loved living there. Loved growing up there. I loved being part of all the events and, 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 and everything that was going on all the time. It was sort of part home, um, but a bit of a venue as well. And that, you know, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, and as I've sort of said, growing up in 400 years of your own history, cocooned by your heritage and and all of your ancestors really is quite quite an amazing experience and certainly um, I, it gave me a very very strong sense of who I was and identity and, and, and those sorts of things and of course I mean is there anyone else in the world that I would prefer to be related to than Jane Austen I mean what an enormous privilege and to have her as a role model when I was young I knew very very young about you know, I was asking questions about, well, why on earth all these people were coming to see her cottage was was the first uh, thing that I couldn't quite get my head around. Why people were coming just to look at old things. But, you know, I would have been four at that stage. So, so not something I could necessarily understand. But to hear stories all my life about this woman who, against all the odds, followed her her conviction and 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 became what she knew she was supposed to be. That was such a powerful, she's such an empowering role model. I think I'm phenomenally lucky to have grown up with her as a member of my family and seeing that as, as something that's, you know, absolutely achievable. There are no limits. Um, and that's something that, uh, that, that Jane Austen taught me. And that's, that's, as I said, a phenomenal privilege. She was a, a, a constant present in, presence in a way, although people are often disappointed to know that we we didn't spend our Sunday afternoons as a family sitting round a fire reading Jane Austen to each other. And people often, I think, think, sort of get the impression that's what it would be. But it wasn't. I mean, she was a constant um, uh, presence in our lives. Um, and, you know, least of all because of all the visitors to the tea room. So we were talking about her all the time. Um, of course, all the, you know, visitors into the village. Um, and she was someone that I was incredibly proud of. Um, and I, I, you know, love the story of how Emma particularly, and Emma's a story, you know, a novel that has particular, I suppose I'm particularly fond of or affectionate for, um, because I was terribly proud as a child that Knightley, the hero Mr Knightley, is obviously uh, named after the Knight family. I just thought that was absolutely marvellous. And the story of how it became dedicated to the Prince Regent is also a, just such a fabulous story. And the words of Jane that are most powerful to me were actually at the end of uh, a letter she wrote to Reverend Clark, who was the Prince Regent's um, librarian, who had suggested the theme of her next novel. And Jane was so incensed because it was it was a, a, a ridiculous romance um, that she wrote a very, very well crafted, firm uh, telling him that she was not going to be taking his advice, but in such a sort of polite and, and such a well crafted way. And the very, very last line on that is, I must keep to my own style and go on in my own way. And although I may never succeed in that, again in that, I'm convinced that I should totally fail in any other. And that, that, that is, that, that those words from Jane are probably the ones that have, um, have stuck with me uh, the best. I always knew we'd have to go. That was never hidden. My parents always spoke honestly with us. I mean, not often. But my brother and I, you know, when we when we asked about it, when it was talked about, we would be told that, yes, when Bapops died, um, it just wasn't going to be possible. Um, you know, the, the, the house needed a lot of money spending on it. I couldn't see that. I mean, when we lived there, oak panelling looks fabulous. You know, the bits of the house we lived in were just wonderful. But but I was a child and I couldn't see, um, you know, perhaps some of the restoration that needed to be done. But it needed so much spending on it and and. Um, there was a house, but there certainly wasn't the fortune to go with it. So I'd always known or I'd always been told, but I didn't believe that. It was too difficult to, first of all, accept that I'd have to leave Chawton, but also very, very hard when when your family, when your grandfather own everything you can see. It's really hard as a kid to get your head around why we can own it to, you know, why we can all be here today and it can be the family home today, but it can't be tomorrow. That's a very difficult thing to understand. So, and I think that, it, yeah, so I just didn't. I mean, I just ignored it. Um, and, and in 1987, um, autumn 1987, I was 17 years old and my father um, came and said that he suggested that I go and have a chat with Bapops who was in his room. Now, Bapops had been fined to his bedroom on a number of occasions through ill health, but he'd just be there for a while. The doctor would come and then he'd be back in his chair in the library um, in, in sort of a few days and nothing much was said about it. 
But this time things were obviously different. And the moment Dad said, I want think you should go and talk to Bapops, I, he didn't need to say why. I knew. I knew what was going on. And I went up to his room, which is the tiny little bedroom. Um, if you've got the main staircase in Chawton House, um, just as you get to the first floor, there's a tiny little room just tucked round there to the left on the first floor. And that was, that was Bapops' bedroom. And I knocked on the door and went in there and we had our only ever conversation, which I which I do write about in the book um, in, in detail. Um, and then a few days later, he, he died. Um, now, I obviously didn't know him. I mean, I didn't. I couldn't grieve for him because I didn't know him. But his death was so significant for our family, so significant. It 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 probably spelt spelt the end. We weren't entirely sure at that point of the Knight family's home being Chawton House, um, and it was going to change all of our lives, all of us. Um, and and that was certainly something that I um, took on board, um, and I took it hard. Um, certainly did. Um, not only was I worried about, as I said, or not only was I very conscious of this moment in in history really as i said of, of perhaps it all coming to an end but i was also very worried for myself you know or, or i didn't want to leave i wanted to stay at chawton house there's no two ways about that anyway leave we did and off i went and left the area and other than a very very brief stay in chawton in in, uh, in about uh, 1993 um i haven't lived in the area since um, I've had I, I eventually had a great career in business, which brought me to Australia in 2008 to be the CEO of a big marketing business over here, which was which was good. Um, and actually, everything was good. You know, my career's done well. And in 2012, I was um, a finalist in the Telstra Business World of the Year Awards here in Australia, which was just extraordinary. Um, and I was made an honorary life fellow of the Australian Institute of Management, which was a phenomenal honour. But all the time, you know, I hadn't, Chawton was still something that weighed heavily on my mind. And then in 2013, the year the year after um, the awards, um, was the 200 year anniversary of the publishing of Pride and Prejudice. And that just, all of a sudden, I mean, I live in Melbourne now, and all of a sudden, everywhere I looked was Jane Austen. Everywhere I looked was Jane Austen. A Jane Austen tea room opened about 10 kilometres from my house. Um, and I realised that, as I said, 25 years by this point had 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 gone. And, and as I said, Chawton, Chawton was still something that I that I um, felt the loss of very much. And I realised at that point that I needed to do something about it. Um, I also realised at that point that with the phenomenal rise in popularity of Jane Austen, particularly over the last sort of 20 years, that there was also a, you know, a philanthropic opportunity and education and literacy is something that I've always been extremely passionate about. I've been on the number, board of a number of educational um, organisations. And so I decided I, there's a few decisions I made back in uh, 2013. One is that I was going to start an organisation called the Jane Austen Literacy Foundation, um, which um, is now absolutely, um, you know, we're doing great work that goes from strength to strength and we're funding projects in Africa and India, which is wonderful. I also decided that I would start my own business, uh, the Grey Fire Group, which I have done, which is a marketing and events business, because that gives me more flexibility to work on things like the foundation, which I do as a volunteer. I also decided that I needed to write a book and I needed to write a book for two reasons. First of all, cathartic for me. I knew that writing a book would help me um, and would help me um, um, get over it. Um, I also knew that I have... Oh, yeah, I have a first hand experience here of Chawton House as a family home. And I just thought that that was worth recording. Um, there's obviously so much written about the house at different times. And I just love the records, obviously, that my ancestors have left um, for us um, and uh, Montague, Montague's book and other things that have been left. And as I said, just thought that it was worth putting down on paper the first hand um, experience that I have. And this is exactly what this book is. It, you know, it's not the history of my family although there's a lot of history in it this is my experience um it's you know as i said it, it's what chalk was about for me what leaving it was about for me and how now i've come back to it um it, 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 and thankfully i have thankfully i have it is such a thrill now to see chalton house um doing so well um and obviously um I, I, I sincerely hope that uh, the current crisis that we're in obviously doesn't d d doesn't prevent it from continuing um, on very well. 
My book uh, was published in 2017, uh, Jane and Me, My Austin Heritage, and it is available at the Chawton House online bookshop if you'd, uh, if you'd like to have a copy. Um, I now still live in Melbourne with my husband and my dog um, and still run my business and run the Jane Austen Literacy Foundation. Um, I also do an awful lot of speaking and have spoken 70, 80 times um, in the last couple of years. Um, and that's, uh, you know, it's such a thrill to be able to talk about Chawton House as well as the foundation. Um, and I've also had the absolute pleasure of speaking at Chawton House a couple of times. I've, I hosted a Regency picnic on the lawns last year and hosted a Dine Like Jane dinner with my family um, and, and uh, you know, in the house, which was just such a thrill. Um, and it's so nice to uh, to be involved again. I hope that uh, that was of interest um, and that you also enjoy the rest of the literacy um, uh, literary festival. I know there's just some excellent speakers on um, and thank you so much to Chawton House for putting this together. Thank you. Bye bye.